So now I'm going to ask Elvin Kurt to come up. He is in charge of, uh, for those that don't know, he's in charge of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for Micronesia. And, you know, it's been very, very busy with everything happening. And uh, we're thankful that you and your family are with us today. And I um, think... Uh, Going, so. All right. Then uh, thank you. Also, Heidi, if you can raise your hand real quick. That's the family right there. We have two beautiful ones. We also have Dr. Jonathan and his family with us. Can you lift up your hand. Welcome to Agate Church. Hey, that's church. All right. All. I have one more story that I have to add on that took place at the clinic in Guam. There, there's one medical practice here on Guam that electricity went out and they lost one million dollars worth of medications. So there's a lot of reasons why we need power. The generator was running out of gas. They called more equipment. They said, because of your status with us, you're not a high enough priority. So there was no guarantee we would get the fuel by the time we needed it. I don't have all of the details of the story, but I know it was late at night. And there were people outside, 10 p.m., and there were people outside looking at the generator trying to figure out what they were going to do. And God made the fuel truck driver get lost who was trying to make a delivery nearby. <laughs> and he pulled up to the only people that he saw outside. He went. That was at 1 a.m. in the morning. And he asked him for directions. Somehow in the conversation, it came up, what are you doing out here at 1 a.m.? He said, we're running out of gas. He says, well, I'm already here. I might as well fill you up. That does not happen by chance. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. And after... Add what you just said. Say again. To add to what you just said. We don't have God on our side. I mean, the truck came up to our place. They delivered the gas next door, and we ran out of gas. It's a question. There are benefits to being faithful followers of God. And honestly, the couple days after the storm, when it was hot and there was no wind and there was no electricity, you look at that, and it did borrows. Makes me happy that it's raining today. 
Even as how so simple, but we did not do prayer here. You know, the title of my sermon today is Successful Restoration. Successful Restoration. And I want to take your mind through a passage of scripture that may be familiar to you, but I hope that you see it in a new way. If you were a Jew, would you like the Babylonians? No, no, you would not. In fact, Babylon, throughout biblical history, after its role in conquering, conquering Judah, would become used in biblical prophecy as the power that tried to force people into false worship. He was the greatest king of Babylon. If I did ever king of Babylon, never can answer. And, and this morning, we are going to read his personal testimony in Daniel chapter 4. You are not in the story. But what I want you to think about today is, is to realize that there is a reason that his personal testimony is in a prophetic book. You have met so much in fact that he is a story. As you were seeing that he would be a poor man, well, when and God was a poor man. Because it has to do with things that cannot be interpreted outside of the context that we have in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, King Nebuchadnezzar, now this is him writing a proclamation, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth. Thinking prophetically, do those words remind you of any other passage of scripture? It wasn't a rhetorical question. Revelation 14, 6. In fact, this is a link that has been established by biblical scholars as a very strong linguistic and, and uh, prophetic link. You went, but I had that. Stop putting on the bread, we'll be seen on. Now, begin here at some point, some of the other. CD, CD, and all of the. You ain't me sitting here. May they have not put it there. Yes, I would rather be sitting. You didn't be getting a forget where I had the summer. Revelation 14, six. Revelation 14, six. Revelation 14, six. In essence, King Nebuchadnezzar is making a proclamation to the known world. 
just like we are to make a proclamation to the entire world. He goes on to say, continuing the last part of verse one, he be multiplied to you. Spoken by a man who made his mark in the world by conquering people and spoken to the people that he had conquered. In peace. To you. He says, it has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Verse 4 starts with Nebuchadnezzar describing that he received a dream. He decreed that people come and interpret his dream. This time he remembered the details, and at last Daniel came. He went, he says to Daniel in verse 9, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, what verse are you on now? Verse 9. In the vision, there was a great tree that grew up high into the sky. It was visible from one end of the earth to the other. It was so big. It was pretty to look at. The fruit was good and the shade was good. 
and the animals and the birds like to find shelter in it. Then a watcher comes down from heaven and says, cut down the tree, cut off its limbs, limbs strip off its leaves, scatter it. But leave the stump and the roots in the ground and bind it with a band of iron and bronze. Historians tell us that the concept of, of these mythical or cosmic trees was something that was common in the, the mythology of the ancient Near East at this time. Large trees were thought to be a bridge between heaven and earth because they have roots in the ground, but yet they reach high up into the sky. But at the same time, this tree that is reaching for the sky that, that the king sees in vision is similar in language to the language that is used at the Tower of Babel when the people are trying to build a tower into the sky. <laughs> Even the metal band is something that would have probably made sense to Nebuchadnezzar. In archaeological excavations in Corsaba, they've actually found trees with band, tree stumps with bands of iron around them. Wow. There's also cylindrical steel that they have found in, in excavations in Akhenatopal that have contained references to trees being banded with iron as well. Hold on. What is this? It's, it's where you take a little piece of clay and then you put markings in it so that they could run it through hot wax. And it, it became a way to copy information. But they, they sometimes they would have a clay photocopier. Yeah, it's like a clay photocopier. They, they would write information on the clay and then they could duplicate it by rolling it through clay or uh, Wax. <laughs> 
Mitzvah for the Torah near the Buddha weekend. I thought he was going to ask me about Ashranasha Paul, but yeah, I was have to tell him I didn't know any more than. <laughs> they they do think that that some of these bands, you know, if you have a valuable tree, and it starts to split, they do think that some of them may have been used to try and and hold the the trunk together to preserve some of the tree longer. You went at a cost me missing with me key. Get good at set, pay a good at the devil working with that. The garage get made it to me that was in a real chair. You were not right in the same or a thirty for the name of the reservoir. Who began with that? Verse seventeen says the sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones to the end. That the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. So the king looks at Daniel and says, Tell me what it means. And I want you to notice verse 19. It says, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed. For a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. That the Hebrew word can be translated where it says dismay in my Bible can be translated to be devastated. Oh, wow. And I got a certain guy where I got a bus me. And I get a row of one. I said, he bought a cost where when I get what I want to run another movie with. And I do a force devastated where when you get. They was ever said what they had Daniel through to me. Not even. Someone once said, if you want to have a short career advising a king, give them bad news. The, the text some scholars say actually is more of an indication of Daniel's personal care for the king and being upset at what he knew was coming. Which is why we have verse 27, where Daniel actually gives the king some personal advice that was not contained in the dream. Says, therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. <laughs> Okay, 
Verse 28 tells us that Nebuchadnezzar actually experienced everything that was prophesied. Verse 29 says at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. I want you to notice how much credit Nebuchadnezzar gives to God in the following statement. Verse 30, is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as the royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. <laughs> One of the greatest miracles of this story is not that God was able to make him go mad and go live like a cow. It's that God could preserve the kingdom for seven years. I didn't do an exhaustive study, but I do want to take the moment to talk about the murder and suicide rate for kings. You went. There were 42 kings who ruled Israel and Judah and one queen. Fifteen were murdered. Murdered. Killed. Three were killed by God. Two committed suicide. That means that you have a 36% chance of being killed 
or committing suicide if you were a king in Israel or Judah? I would argue that the odds that you could vacate the throne for seven years and then come back are much slimmer. Some other research that I did said that the, the rate for murder of a king has risen and fallen throughout history. They would estimate that the average is about 20% or one in five. You it's an incredible leadership vacancy, and it is a testament not only to God's power to be able to raise up and take down kings, but also to maintain order in the kingdom in the absence of a king. Verse 34 says, at the end of the day, because I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. I just read the, the first part of 34. 34. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. We'll start when he lifted his eyes to heaven, it doesn't just mean that he looked. It means that he is acknowledging the supremacy of God and willingly taking his rightful place in God's order. Once he was recalibrated to who God is and who he was, God restored him. And verse 37 or verse 36, the last part says that God restored him with even more greatness. Than he had had 
Ötilosepen. Asinleri Leryan. Asinleri Bergen Bor Agostinleri Leryan. Möbi Giraya. Bu Erana Baray Feyetçi ya bu kadar ne sap seni bombarı. Verse 37 wraps up Nebuchadnezzar's testimony by saying, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Amen. Since the typhoon hit, how many of you feel like you might be wandering around not quite in your right mind like a wild animal? It's amazing how much lack of electricity can humble us. It's amazing. Many of us may have grown up with less access to water and electricity than we have now. The cost may be. It's been put in. It's been put in already. It's been put in. 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 It might be like Nebuchadnezzar saying, look at this life that I have built for myself. One commentator on this passage wrote this and said, This is a story of warning to us all. If we make our happiness depend on anything less than God's plan for us, we invite failure. Right now, there's a lot of focus on restoration after the damage from the typhoon. But God is ultimately concerned about our personal restoration so that we are ready for eternity. Amen. The reason that Nebuchadnezzar's testimony is in a prophetic book is because we can never lose sight of the fact that God is after everyone, even the head of the country that was an enemy of his chosen people. Amen. And 
E aí, igual todo mundo, é que eu é só o Renan Renan Renan, é que eu é cos nele. E aí, igual todo mundo, é que eu é só o Renan Renan Renan. Prophets and Kings, page 521, says the once proud monarch had become a humble child of God. If the trajectory of his life that we have in scripture is maintained on that great day of complete restoration of our lives when God raises the dead and calls us to him at his second coming. Nebuchadnezzar will be there with us. And one of the greatest kings that ever lived in this world is going to bow down at Jesus' feet. And he is going to say, you are the king of kings. And the Lord of Lords. Amen. And he's going to tell us, I'm so glad that I was willing to do God's plan. So today, I invite you to raise your hand with me and just say, God, I, as much as there is to distract us, I don't want to lose sight of your plan. Because it is a plan for today, and it is a plan for complete restoration. Yes, Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you see the hands that were raised. We ask that you would give us the strength and the desire to be faithful to you in all things. Forgive us for the times that we go our own way. We know that you have plans that are in our best interest, and we want to follow you and be faithful to you no matter what. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.